This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit like and subscribe, whatever you're listening on. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King and Tom Branham, uh, Ball State athlete Paul Havocott, joined by a special guest tonight, the former cornerback in the NFL out of Southern University, drafted in the fourth round by the, right here, <laughs> New, England, New England Patriots. He's a member of the 1989 NFL All-Rookie Team. Uh, he's got 27 career interceptions, four forced fumbles. He's a member of the New England Patriots All-1990s team. So we got Maurice Hurst here. Maurice, thank you for joining us. All right. My pleasure. Looking awesome. forward to it. <laughs> and, and he's going to be perfect for tonight's debate because we're going to uh -oh. debate the top five corners of all time. And, uh oh uh, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and of course, we'll have a Q&A for, for him about his career after the debate, but we're going to jump right into this, and we're going to go with uh, Brian and Night Train Lane. All right. So we got Dick Night Train Lane. Uh, played from 1952 to 1965 with the Rams, Cards, and Lions, Six foot one, 194 pounds. When Night Train was born, it was under the most humble of circumstances. Uh, he was unwanted by both his mother and father, and he was left for dead in a dumpster in Austin, Texas. But fortunately, a woman uh, by the name of Ellen Lane heard him crying and rescued him and adopted him. Uh, Night Train went, uh, went to a very small school called Scott's Bluff and went undrafted in 1952. Uh, then he showed up at the L.A. Rams facilities for a tryout and wowed the scouts. Uh, he had an, an all-time amazing rookie season picking off 14 passes in just 12 games. Um, and and here, uh, 70 years later, no one has ever touched that record. Uh, Night Train, who got his nickname because of his love for uh, Bud Buddy Morrow's song uh, by the same name, he could hit you like a train. Bleacher Report once ranked him as the 12th hardest hitter of all time, regardless of position on the field. Uh, check out some of his old clips. I mean, he really looked like he was trying to take someone's head off. The night train, he ended up being named to the first uh, All-Pro team seven times. Uh, he made seven trips to the Pro Bowl, made the 1950s All-Decade team, the 50th, 70th, and the 100th NFL anniversary teams, and his 68 career interceptions is the second most in NFL history. And in 2010, NFL Network named him the 30th best player ever, and he was the top cornerback on their list. So, Maurice, uh... I have to ask this question. Could he even play in today's NFL? And, and what are your thoughts on him? I might I might move him to free safety, maybe strong safety. But yeah. he, today's game is a little bit different at the corner position. And uh, But with those kind of stats and, uh, I mean, the guy was not only a fierce hitter, but he was, you know, taking the ball away. It was That's what the cornerback, uh, you want your cornerbacks to do so. I, you know, can he play today? I don't know. That's always a debate. I think the game has changed a little bit. And we might have him as a nickel or <laughs> some kind of inside linebacker. I don't know now. And, uh, you know, we've said before on prior shows, they've, they've banned the headshots. This was things that guys in the 60s and 70s were kind of known for. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on how a defensive back has to play now? Have the game, they've made it harder for them. Do you ever see it getting easier at any point? No, but I, I noticed that the players are actually, the, the defensive backs are actually kind of adapting to the rules a little bit. You see less pass interference calls. You see more guys starting to figure out, uh, you know, what the routes are intended for. So as the as the corner, I think you have to also fill a route. If it's an underthrow, the guy is not trying to get over the top of you, just things like that. But I think the players are starting to practice that more and now you're going to see these players start to defend I think a little bit better without a lot of the, the penalties when it first started it was penalty after penalty but I think now those guys are adjusting in practices and things like that and figuring out just what the throws are actually going to be at because they're timing throws and they're on they're to a point so I think as a corner if they start to learn how to do that and start to time it out then I think they can, they're, they're going to adjust all right let's move on to Charles Woodson Okay, Charles Woodson played fo uh, college football at Michigan, and he won the Heisman Trophy there. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think out of all the defensive players, he was one of the only ones that win a Heisman Trophy, and he won the 97 National Championship as a junior. 
Um, it, it said in several sources he was the only uh, defensive player to win the Heisman to date, so I'm thinking that's still accurate. Selected fourth overall by the Raiders in the 98 NFL draft. He was a Pro Bowl selection for his first four seasons, uh, first two team all pro honors as well. He played cornerback and safety. Uh, Brian was throwing out his stats uh, for his guy's weight. So Charles was 6'1", 210, a little bit bigger. Um, played for the Raiders from 98 to 05, Packers from 06 to 12, and then back with the Raiders again from 13 to 15. He actually was a Super Bowl winner, number, uh, let me do my quick conversion here of no renewals, 45 with the Packers. Um, so he's got a bunch of awards here. NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 09, Rookie of the Year in 98, a uh, bunch of All-Pro elections. Um, let me get to some other things here. Look at these, listen to these career stats, though, compared to some of the other ones. 1,105 total tackles, 20 sacks, 33 forced fumbles, 65 interceptions, 13 defensive touchdowns, and uh, 155 passes deflected. Um, compared with who we're talking about tonight, I kind of felt like Charles Woodson was a little bit like an underdog, maybe underrated, but he's got some great stats. But that's uh, Charles Woodson. So 11 of his interceptions came at safety. Uh, Maurice, your, your thoughts on Woodson, uh, Charles Woodson, and how hard is it to make that adjustment going from corner to safety? Well, Woodson was a very good player. I, you know, I consider Woodson being really a ball hawk, and, and he was a guy that was always <laughs> around the ball. And, I, it, you know, it didn't matter. He was causing fumbles. He was taking interceptions. So, I, you know, you kind of always saw him no matter what. When you were watching the game, his name showed up, whether it was on a tackle, uh, pass defense and things like that. And uh, I think in his in his situation, I think it was the right time to make the change because uh, I think the receivers were, were getting a little bit better. I'm not going to say the guys we played against were bad, but I think the quarterback and the timing and stuff of that uh, became something. But as safety, you could just see his ability still to find the football, uh, although being 11, only 11 interceptions of the 65, he still noticed that he got around the football. So this guy, to me, probably all-around player, just complete. He could play anywhere in the secondary, and, and I think he should be considered one of the best guys to play the position. So from one Woodson to another, let's go Rod Woodson. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is my boy, Rod Woodson. This is my <laughs> boy right here. Let's see. He had, I believe he was a three-time All-America Purdue from like 1984 to 1986. I mean, that's pretty impressive coming out of college. He was the number 10 overall pick by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1987. And that was even a surprise that he was there at number 10 overall, from what I heard. But let's see, for his career now, you don't get 47 interceptions at one position. Now, I know he had 71 for his career, but we're, talk we're talking about his career corner. He had 47 interceptions at cornerback for about, 11 years, 87 to 98. Let's see, he was, and eight of those were pick sixes. That's pretty impressive. How often does a cornerback get named Defensive Player of the Year? Well, he did in 93, so he must have done something right. And how often do you know of cornerbacks that can have 13 and a half sacks in their career at that position? I mean, that's pretty impressive. He had eight in 1992. Who would have never thought that? Seven Pro Bowl bids at corner, which is really impressive, in my opinion. But six-time first-team All-Pro. And they mentioned the, the anniversary team. He was a member of the 75th and 100th anniversary teams of all time, and he was 1990s All-Decade. Does it get any better than that? Those Steelers defense, they sent the players from all over to go get those sacks. But great kick returner. Um, I I I want to I or punt return. Yeah, I want to ask you, Maurice, uh, this question. Um, uh, obviously, tell me about your thoughts on Rod Woodson. But the turf at Three River Stadium ruined this guy's career as a corner. To blew out. I think it was his MCL and ACL, and he went to safety. Pretty much, he played one season in San Francisco at corner. It didn't work out super great. Went to safety the rest of his career. How bad was playing on AstroTurf back then in the in the nineties? 
That was pretty bad. I think they even have a lot of lawsuit out. Um, uh, the receiver, oh. remember the receiver from um, LSU, Wendell Davis. We he was playing at. I think it was in Philly because they their stadium they had the football and baseball <laughs> in the same stadium, and they were playing around the same time. So on the field, they actually had where the bases were like turf built up like a curb on the side of a road. I mean, they actually filled that in and had to put something in there to hold mm. it, and that was actually part of the field. And, you know, this is the time you talk about the NFL, and you're saying to yourself, you can't be playing on this, man. I mean, they actually had – each one of the bases had turf with a little hump in it all the way around the, the outside of it to <laughs> hold it. And I said to myself – but me, you know, I wasn't complaining because I can't, I came from Southern University, so I said to myself, "Well, this is a big old stadium," and wow. you know, the pros were playing on it. But unfortunately, Wendell Davis blew both of his knees out, I think, in that stadium, and that cost him a career. He was a very good player. I mean, he was a good player, and and I've seen the turf. Even when I first got to New England, the turf was pretty bad. But this was kind of different because you had one end of the field that had this baseball diamond and all this in it and the other half was you know just turf so uh the turf i think is better now obviously you got the new turf so uh, it was something that needed to be addressed so for one about, oh, yeah, go, go ahead, Brian. Um, yeah. 1995 season he in the i think it was week one he went to try yeah, to tackle uh barry sanders and got juked out and and blew his knee out and he actually he was the first player to ever return from an injury like that in the same season because he played in the Super Bowl and he covered uh, Michael Irvin. So that was just another tremendous yeah. thing about Ron Woodson. Yeah, and and and, and on, from his standpoint, he was the first one of the first cornerbacks to kind of really convert the game to a big, fast guy at the corner position who could tackle. And around that time, they started to blitz the safety. I, I, me personally, I ended up with maybe three or four sacks in my career, and I wasn't a, <laughs> you know, I wasn't a Rod Wilson, but they did started to send us off the corner because it was the blind side of the quarterback. So I think that when he had them eight sacks that one season, uh, that was the turning point when teams started to realize they could blitz that corner, not only get a sack, but force a quick throw, you know, to man uncovered, but everybody's really going to him. So I think that that started that, and, and Wilson was one of the first corners that they allowed to do that, and then you start to see corner blitzes kind of after, you know, come after that. Well, from one stealer to another, let's go Mel Blunt. So Mel, <laughs> 57 career interceptions, yeah. played for Pittsburgh from 1970 all the way up to 83. He's also got 13 fumble recoveries, we can add in on that. Um, 1975, Defensive Player of the Year, uh, of course, uh, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, of course, but he's a six-time All-Pro. He's also a member of that NFL 100 all-time team. Um, so he's got six, the six All-Pros that I mentioned. He's also got five Pro Bowls. Um, the, the thing about Blunt is he could play zone, but he could also play man-to-man. -man. Sometimes we see corners that have trouble doing one or the other. Um, he was great at the bump and run. Uh, physically strong, and, um, you know, obviously he helped Pittsburgh win four Super Bowls there in, in the 70s. Um, but his dominance also inspired the NFL to impose a new rule that uh, prohibits contact with a wide receiver for the first five yards. So that rule was actually uh -huh. majorly started because of Mel Blunt. So yeah. Maurice, he, he, he may be part of the greatest – uh, let's say seven, eight year run of a defense of all time with the steel curtain there. With uh, so, what are your thoughts on Mel Blunt? Yeah, actually, he's uh, he's alumni of Southern University, so uh, oh, yeah. So, but yeah. anyways, um, yeah, Mel was one of those corners too, kind of like Woodson. He was tall, he was pretty big, and he was long. And and I think they they started to want that also because of the throws, you know, the fade throws in the end zone and things like that. So. Mel kind of transcended that position to that, also to that big type corner with long arms, and he uh, he um, he was the guy that if he got his hands on you, you were done for the day, and it wasn't a lot of holding calls, you know, back then. But uh, he was a guy <laughs> with long arms, and like I said, if he got a hold to you, 
he made the throw difficult too. Any throw that you had to make, you had to make a perfect throw. So I think he kind of brought that bump and run. You know, him and Lester Hayes and those guys brought that bump and run where the corners were up. You were talking about a corner playing zone and man, but they most of them started out pretty much with bump and run, man to man coverage. And he was one of those guys on that steel curtain that did that. Plus, they had a very good rush. I must say, <laughs> it wasn't a drop back and wait five seconds. It was a get it out your hand type of throw. So that might have contributed to some of his success also. Well, the champ is here, Champ Bailey. All right, Champ Bailey. Uh, 1999 to 2013, uh, six foot tall and 192. Uh, Champ came out of the University of Georgia, and he was taken seventh overall by the Skins, 1999. Uh, he spent his first five five seasons with the Skins until he was involved in one of the biggest blockbuster trades in NFL history. He was dealt to the Broncos along with a second round pick in exchange for Pro Bowl running back Clinton Portis. Uh, with the Broncos, Champ Champ raised his game to an insane level. Uh, he was a first team All Pro for the next three seasons, and he probably had the greatest single season that a cornerback has ever had in tw- in two thousand six. Uh, how good was his 2006 season? Well, the receivers that he was covering were only targeted 35 times. So that's a, just a little bit over two per game. Um, out of those 35 targets, he intercepted a league leading 10 of them. 21 of them ended up incomplete and just four were caught. So just an, an astounding season. Uh, Champ was uh, a complete cornerback as well. According to Stat News, he had the 12th most career tackles in NFL history for a corner. Uh, he is also the all-time leader in pass, uh, passes defended with 203, and his 52 INTs is the 15th highest career total. When the dust finally settled on his career, he had earned seven All-Pro selections, 12 trips to the Pro Bowl, a spot on the NFL's 2000s uh, All-Decade team, and a first ballot entry into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So that's Champ Bailey. Steve Smith called him the greatest corner of all time. So that's some high praise there from a, a, a very good wide receiver. Maurice, tell me about Champ Bailey, but also I, I look at the Major League Baseball, NHL, NBA. When, when they get to the trade deadline, there's a there's a bazillion trades. You got to check your rosters. Why don't we see that in the NFL? There's hardly ever trades. I know, you know, a lot of stuff going on, though, leading up to that, people don't realize. There are some things, but everything has to fall into place. And I think it's kind of hard when you're in the middle of a season or, you know, you're starting and you want to make that trade. Somebody, you've got to make sure that you're getting the right thing for where you give it up. And and they work those trades like that. And I actually have scouts. I did some scouting with the Cowboys. They actually have scouts who, when they want to do a trade, they have them grade these players prior to. So there's a lot of work leading up to it. I think it's just – rare in football because you 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 lose a good player you got to get something for it you know and and I think it's sometimes it's it's not a lot about budget or whatever you want the best player so baseball I think got a little more leeway in in, in their players and uh, and they're able to do a basketball also but it's a lot of work leading up to it just a lot of times it doesn't happen and your thoughts on champ Champ was a complete cornerback to me. Champ was one of those guys that started where you mentioned earlier he only had 35 passes. He's one of those guys that you call a shutdown corner, and that was legitimately that's what he did. And he took the best receiver that they had and count on that player getting the job done. And he he was challenged with that quite a bit. So uh, he was one of those guys that, that turned himself into what I truly call a shutdown corner, a guy that can – actually take a guy out of the game and you would have to kind of game plan around him and say, this is just gone today. We have to work other places. So he kind of transcended that part of the game. I think that man to man type, I have my man, you guys take care of the rest of it, but he was complete player. Let's head out to the Island, Rebus Island. Yeah. If he's not the best, he's got one of the best nicknames, right? Rebus Island. He attended the university of Pittsburgh and played for, you know, played Pittsburgh Panthers football, earned his first uh, team freshman All-America honors in tw- uh, 2004. In his first game, I mean, the thing with Earl Rivas is 
the scouts, everybody talking about him, they said this is somebody you can plug into your system and immediately he's effective. He's a lockdown receiver in the truest sense. So it's kind of some irony. You know, he ended up in the Super Bowl with the Patriots, but his first game against the New England, in, England uh, Patriots, he recorded seven tackles, held Wes Welker to six catches for 61 yards, and his first interception uh, of his career against uh, division rival Buffalo Bills during their Week 8 matchup. It, he each season, each game, each week, he he showed great progression. He would seemingly he would learn from his mistakes and tweak things and become like a perfectionist. And so, like if you ever get a chance to look at his at his uh, wiki page, every season starts out with like what receiver he goes up against, where he's just locking him down. So like in the 08 season, they opened up against the Miami Dolphins. And uh, he intercepts Chad Pennington in the end zone with five seconds remaining in the game to preserve a win. So he's he's having uh, impact on the team. He goes up against players like Randy Moss, holds him to uh, two catches for 22 yards. Uh, 2009 season, uh, he's all over Andre Johnson, the Houston Texans uh, receiver star back then, holds him to 35 yards, faces Tom Brady and the Patriots later on. Um, and li- limits Randy Moss again to four reception for 24 yards. He, in 2010, he holds out. So a lot of people remember that. He kind of loses a little bit of favor, but then he goes on to have impact for that team again in the 2011 wild card game, uh, holding Reggie Wayne to one catch. This guy went up against a lot of prime receivers, played for a lot of teams though too, Jets, Buccaneers, Patriots, Jets again. And then the Chiefs in 2017, he did win one Super Bowl, like I mentioned, because uh, they decided to uh, throw the ball instead of give it to Marshawn Lynch. And uh, thanks to Malcolm Butler, you know, Revis gets his first Super Bowl. But he finishes with 487 tackles, 29 interceptions, 139 pass deflections. I think this guy, stats or no stats, I think he was just an immediate impact and just a great lockdown corner. Maurice, this guy was so good, Tom Brady wouldn't throw at him. What's that say? <laughs> that says a lot. I mean, yeah, Tom ain't crazy either. But, uh, yeah, Rebus was another guy like Champ that uh, kind of helped had teams realize they could take their best corner and put on a guy and for the rest of the day, and they pretty much shut him down. And I think, like you said, the quarterbacks were more <laughs> intimidated, I think, than the receivers. The wide receiver always thinks he's open. And he always wants the ball. So, but Rivas to me was a guy that uh, he reminds me of another guy. We might get to that guy. We'll see. But uh, he he um, he had very very good hips, and he could turn. He could run. He was physical also. So he wasn't as physical as uh, you know the big guys like Woodson and, and those guys there. But he was pretty physical. I need a light. He was pretty. I need a light. He was pretty physical in that he. Uh, he would he could tackle and he was very good at the line of scrimmage and bump and run. Well, it's prime time. Give us Dion. <laughs> prime time, baby. It's prime time. You better believe that. Let's see. He had a very good career at Florida State. So good of a career. He had his number retired. How how much better do you need a college career to be than that? I mean <laughs> And then you look at his pro career, which was, and then immediately he made we make impacts. I mean, he was about six foot one hundred ninety five, so he was no slouch in the size department either. You mentioned the big corners; he was no slouch in the size department, but he wasn't a very physical physical tackling corner because it was a business decision, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, that's coming from his mouth. But I mean, and he mentioned he mentioned. I think in his career, I only saw one guy beat him. Now, Maurice, I'm sure somebody, I'm sure you, you might have seen more than one person beat him, but the one person I could remember beating him was Flipper Anderson, like a 73 yard touchdown. I'm not sure, but I believe it was a 73 yard touchdown. And was- Flipper Anderson. Oh, yeah, for the Rams. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. It might have been there may have been others, but that's the one I could always remember. But let's stick to the task at hand here. He had a fifty three interceptions, that's and nine pick sixes included in that. That's remarkable. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? 
And then yep. you mentioned, I mentioned Woodson won a defensive player of the year in 93. Oh my gosh, he won it in 94. Back to back corners. How does that happen? And then you have, let's not forget, he had a six time first team All Pro who made eight Pro Bowls, which is pretty impressive. He made the NFL's 100th anniversary team. And I think he was all decades team in the 1990s. He was, he was scary every time somebody, every time he threw at him, he was scary. And yeah, he was just scary to throw to. You know, like he was ahead of his time. A tall corner like that that could run that fast. That was remarkable. So, Maurice, this is a guy who early on in his career was going back from baseball to football, <laughs> sometimes in the same week. We saw uh, with the Braves in the playoffs, he go play the playoff game and then go play his game on Sunday for the, the Falcons at that time. Um, I'm sure that takes a lot. But uh, for me, he may be the GOAT as far as coverage. I will never vote for a man who wouldn't tackle. I'm sorry. that, that That's my thing. But, you know, what, what are your thoughts on primetime? Yeah, and I'm, I don't think people look at him as a tackler, but if, I don't know how many tackles he had in his career, and it definitely wasn't because they were throwing the ball to the receiver and they were catching it. So I would check his statistics tackling-wise because I thought he was a complete corner. Is he a cover two corner? No. You know, Woodson was a cover two corner. He was a man-to-man corner. And, and, uh, but if, I think if you look at his statistics in terms of tackles, you find that he he wasn't afraid to tackle. Uh, he he would say that, but um, he wasn't really afraid to tackle. And I tell you a story. We were I was drafted the same year he was drafted, and unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, I did make the All Rookie Team. He didn't make it. I don't know how, but he didn't make it. I think the guy from Chicago Bears made it, but we were all rookies together, and uh, so. Uh, that's probably was the only time I was better than Dion at the time. But <laughs> yeah, no, it was funny, right? We were playing, we were playing them, and our coach decided to open a game up with a go route against Dion. You know, this was just the talk of the team, and they they did it with our fastest guy, and Dion Sanders outran him the football and everything. And he turned around and he came down our sideline. He says. You guys don't have one player who can outrun me on this sideline. He pointed at the coaches, and I said, "Oh my god, that's over with." But it was funny that they tried to catch him. You know, they figured they'd get a long ball on him, but it wasn't happening. But he's a—he was a very good corner. Well, if you want to know who the best is, just ask Dion. He'll tell you. It's, oh yeah, it's, it's yeah. Dion. Dion, like, Dion, Dion is, he is the best. Dion, we were at the combine and we were working out, and all of a sudden you saw this door open at the far end, and this guy comes in with a mink coat, and everybody stopped and looked at the door. And was like, who is that? He got these glasses on, shades. He's got a mink coat on. He takes the coat off. He has a warm up suit under. He jogs down 100 yards, jog back. He goes and get on the line and runs like four, two, three or something. Turns around, put his sweat suit back on, his fur coat, and walked out the door. And everybody <laughs> stood there looking at their watches. All the scouts and the coaches were like just looking at each other like, oh, my good. Everybody stopped working out. So, But he turned out to be the player he was. Dion was probably the best corner to play the game. Well, let's move on to our final player tonight. That's going to be Darrell Green. Played for the Redskins from 83 to 02. So, I mean, that is some super longevity there. And he played till he's 42 years old. Imagine still covering people at 42 years old. Um, so that's very impressive. He's got 54 career interceptions, 10 fumble recoveries. And he's a member of the 83 All-Rookie Team. Uh, he's got the 96 Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, which is just a, a, a wonderful a, a award to win. He's a seven-time Pro Bowler. Uh, he's got four All-Pro selections. Another guy on that NFL 100 all-time team. Um, he's on the 90s All-Decade team. Holds 14 NFL records, which is just super impressive. And uh, I we have a lot of fast guys that are on here tonight, but he may be the fastest 4.09 40-yard dash time 
Um, that was obviously the, the the fastest man in the NFL at, at that for sure. Uh, but yeah, just a just an ageless wonder. Didn't have a lot of size. Um, he was a, he was pretty tiny at five eight, but uh, that didn't stop him from from playing fantastic football. Maurice, your thoughts on Darrell? He got a couple Super Bowls. Just fast as heck. Great cover. What are your thoughts on him? Yeah, he was just, he was really fast. I mean, that was one of his uh, <laughs> trades that he had, but uh, nobody could really outrun him. Anybody that he faced couldn't outrun him. And um, he, he, even though he was undersized, I think he, he knew how to position himself to be in, you know, to get the ball basically or get his hands on the ball. But I remember one night we were playing them and uh, Irvin Fryer, you probably remember Irvin Fryer, yeah. Irvin Fryer beat him on a stuttering go route. And we were on like our, I promise, maybe out of 10 or 15 yard line. And Irvin beat him. He caught the ball in stride. And do you know Dow Green caught him before he got like to the 20 yard line? And this <laughs> Irvin Fryer was a 4 2 also. So this tells you Damn. just how fast this guy, because we thought Irvin had scored. Anybody else, he scores. But Dow Green, he beat him on the starter and go and caught the ball. It was no break, no stride. No, I've never seen nobody catch Irvin. He really walked him down and basically <laughs> tackled him about the 20-yard line, which was, like, incredible. But, um, you know, undersized guy, but to, but he was a ball guy, too. He caught the ball very well. So uh, I think he um, he was one of those smaller corners. Uh and he he could play today. That's the guy that could play today in this league because he was. That's how his technique was kind of like he would just shadow you enough, and he was quicker than you and faster. So uh, he wouldn't fight you at the line of scrimmage, but he was a guy that could get the job done. Well, let's move into our vote tonight. Cannot pick your own guys, Paul. Uh, I, I looked up. Deion Sanders, it looked like he had 492 career tackles, and that's solid. It's right in line with Rivas, kind of. So I'll do – I'll pick prime time, and then uh, – who'd you have, Brian? You had Rod Woodson, and who was your other one? Well, you only get one vote, right? <laughs> I only get one. You have to pick two? Okay. No, I'll, no, just I'll, I'll do prime time, yeah. Okay, I was going to do Rod Woodson as 1A, but no, just one then. Tom? Looks like I'm going to be the tiebreaker. <laughs> Uh, I think, well, for me, I would have to go with Daryl Green. I mean, not many could beat him. And, yeah, he may have been undersized, but his technique was incredible. And he was – I mean, you wouldn't throw at him ever. If you were, you were a fool. Ryan. Um, I got it. You got, you got to get Rod Woodson on here, man. Rod Woodson was uh, just just uh, just amazing. And then, I mean, being able to go, I mean, he had this great career with the Steelers. He went to the Ravens, won a Super Bowl. He made an impact with the Raiders. I mean, he was just, just such a great all-around player. Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the other Woodson on. I, I think Charles Woodson belongs on this list. I was always very impressed watching him, uh, especially his time with the Raiders. I thought. When he first came in the league, I, I thought he was basically the best corner in the league for a good four or five years there. So, Maurice, we come to you for the, our last pick. You can choose Mel Blunt, Darrell Revis, Champ Bailey, or Night Train Lane. I'm going to go with Night Train Lane. After hearing those statistics, those stats as a rookie, 14 INTs, and he was also a tackler. I mean, the guy obviously was a – Guy that could tackle and catch the football. So I would think in my mind that would be the guy I would go with. Awesome. So Legacy Bow's top five corners of all time, Deion Sanders, Rod Woodson, Darrell Green, Charles Woodson, Night Train Lane. Nice job, guys. Let's move into our Q&A. We're going to go Brian, Paul, Tom, me. All right, I'll go with this question. Okay, so Maurice, what, while you were – you know, you were really performing well. Things were pretty rough in New England during the first part of your your career there uh, under Rod Rust and then Dick McPherson. But then it, it all turned around, you know, when the Patriots brought in the big tuna, Bill Parcells. So uh, what was the feeling around the team and the locker room and everything when, when Parcells was hired and 
and what did he bring to the table for you guys? Well, when we first got Coach Parcells, I mean, I was excited about it. Uh, he, he and I had a little run in because he brought some people in from the Giants and from some other teams, and you know, he kind of wanted to pay them more money. So uh, he he ended up I ended up telling him I wasn't going to sign it for less than what you gave these guys. So it was funny that I, he told me okay, and I was about to leave New England, and his secretary called my office and. I called my hotel room and said, Coach said, get back down here. He said, what you want? I said, I just want more than me. Both of them. <laughs> he laughed. He said, I, you got it. But anyways, when Tudor came in, he just brought something that you knew it was like professional. And and even though I had we had practice against him in, uh, down in uh, Rhode Island a couple of years when I was a rookie, we practiced against him. And uh, you could just see how his team was run. Even though we had Coach Barry and we were pretty – we were uh, kind of like an older team. So, uh, but you could just see the difference in the Giants and then kind of like us. So, but when Parcells came in, he just brought something like he made you accountable. You know, he made you accountable from the time you got from the, uh, you know, working out and uh, just getting in shape. He was, he made you accountable for everything that you did. So, but he was a coach that, once you did what he asked you to do and you got on his good side, I think he was one of those coaches that um, that you wanted to play for. Maurice, is the wide receiver position in football, has that evolved the least out of all the other positions, in your opinion? Or has it just gotten, I guess, faster? I mean, when I think of, you know, the quarterback rules have obviously changed. Tight ends have gotten bigger and stronger. Running backs are used differently. But wide receivers, you run the routes, you cover them. Do you agree with that, or do you think that's evolved as well? Um, I, you know, I kind of agree with it. Some of it is is a little ticky tacky, you know, in terms of some some of the contact that the players have. But I, I think what it boils down to, honestly, the way I look at it and what approach it is, it's similar to being seven on seven now. So it's something that you practice, you know, in practice. It's just like open air quarterback drop back. You know, they seven on your seven. And, you know, you, you have I think you have to learn to play like that. You know, even in practice we had that, but a lot of times you you couldn't get your hands on them. You weren't hitting the guys and things like that. So uh the wide receiver position and the quarterback position together, you could kind of see as evolved to something that's it makes it very difficult for defensive back to just really be one of those guys that's going to ever have a champ Bailey type year. You're not going to have that now because you're going to get beat. Even though you're good, you're going to get beat sooner or later the way that they've been able to distribute this football these days. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I got. I, I'd like to ask you one thing about when you played at Southern. What was your favorite rivalry game? <laughs> you know that one, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know that one. That's the Bayou Classic. <laughs> that I was every so. year. Whether, whether we won two games or nine games, you could not lose that football game right there. And and I grew up going to it, and it was it was a rivalry ever since I used to go oh. watch play in the Superdome. But that, yeah, you had to win that game. Uh, you had a very long off season. Did matter. Oh. Yeah. I <laughs> I it was our Super Bowl. That. It was like our Super Bowl, our Rose Bowl, honestly, because you went from playing at Southern Stadium to and you got 70,000 people in this stadium, and you're saying, golly, you're on television. So it got to be pretty big for us, that game. I got to say, that's one of the most underrated rivalry games I've ever seen. Cause I used to see it somewhat on national television when I, when I was a teenager. I'm like, yeah. how isn't this game more exposed? It was – it's, I think it's a great rivalry, believe it or not. Hey, yeah, it was hey, it was our rivalry. That's it the way is. they were you were from New Orleans. That's the way they recruited you, brought you to the Bayou Classic, and you were just like, I was overwhelmed. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's going to come back with the way that the teams are, are getting a little bit more exposure on television. I think that game is going to come back as a rival. So. You faced a lot of good quarterbacks in your career, but I, I look at the division you're in, and two times a year you got to face in their prime Dan Marino, Jim Kelly. 
I guess the question would be, which one did you fear the least? I mean, like, which which one did you not want to play? <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you that. I mean, both of them were very good quarterbacks, but it, it, it would be the one I feared the most was Dan Marino because I just honestly think Dan Marino was making up routes in the huddle. I don't, I don't think, <laughs> think these were plays. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? You sometimes you would if you would intercept him. I intercepted my rookie year, and he just looked at me like, mm, okay, all right, rookie. And I said, well, I got the upper hand, you know, but he still was throwing the football on us. And I'm saying to myself, man, this is this is the world's worst. He just knew what was coming. He knew he was just – it was weird the way he used to play. And he would he would come to you. He, the receivers would run back to the huddle crying to him. I was open. And he would turn to me and say, was he open? And I said, nah, he wasn't open. <laughs> so, Dad, was he like, yeah, always open. So, they were tough. Dan Marino, Duper, and Clayton, that was a tough bunch for a couple of years there. Yeah. So, uh, Maurice, you played alongside uh, Hall of Famer Aeneas Williams at Southern. Uh, I mean, what a great cornerback pair that you guys made. Uh, uh, what was it like playing with him? And and also, what what are your thoughts on all the, the love that the historic black universities, like your alma mater, has really been getting, been getting in the last uh, few years? Yeah, Aeneas was a good player. Aeneas walked on at Southern and uh, turned himself into an all-pro. And he was one of the guys I thought might have made that list, but, you know, we got one Southern guy on there, so that was okay. But he ended up with quite a few interceptions. Uh, Aeneas was really strong and, and, and had real good endurance. And I think what happened was he um, he just – he was a ball hawk too, and Aeneas was a very, very good tackler that because he was a safety when he played at Southern when I was there. He was a free safety. And then they moved him to corner. So uh, when he first came out, he was a safety, and but he was a hard hitter. And then when he kind of learned the position at corner, that following year, he uh, he he was the guy that went and got the football. He even got a an award named after him. And at, uh, as far as the the black college the HBCUs <clears throat> getting, I, I think it's something that's it's growing pretty good. So you know with the um, with all the new coaches coming in, former players, some former alumni and things like that, Deion Sanders has brought quite a bit of attention to the to the HBCU, uh, you know, game. So I think when you when you start to get guys like that and you start to get the media wants to be around, it's going to be good exposure. And they're getting some good players. And hopefully they can get some players drafted here coming up, you know, in the next couple of years. But they're getting some very good players. Hey, Paul, before you go, hold on one sec. <laughs> I forgot to add in earlier our shout-outs, the guys that just missed the list tonight, and that was Mike Haynes, Ty Law, Lester Hayes, Aeneas Williams, and Ken uh, Riley. So those I, are guys I, that just missed I, the I list. Two, the two that I was going to say was Aeneas and uh, Ty Law. Because both okay. of them were big players. That's what I was thinking. But, hey, it was a good list. Yep. Go ahead, Paul. Your son plays – football now is there a piece of advice that you gave to him that you wish you would have received when you were starting out playing football well um you mean for at the pro level mm -hmm. well I mean I think I think now they kind of when I came out it was not a lot of you didn't have availability to with to people that would teach you things that were going to come up in you know in the NFL and how you were going to face it so but I think now that, you know, these colleges prepare these guys for the NFL, they prepare them for certain things. The NFL, once you get there now, is preparing players for, you know, life after football, things like that, things you go through during the season. So, uh, you know, and the game has changed a little bit. We were, like, stuck on a team and loyal to that team. I mean, now you have guys, they get cut, you know, they leave the team things like that, they actually be traded. So, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a kind of a different game right now. But uh, in terms of just being prepared for what he's going to go through in terms of sometimes injuries happen, but you've got to get yourself, when you're coming back, a player wants to play immediately, but you've got to get yourself to 80 90%, regardless, because you're not going to be effective. And, uh, you know, he's been on, he had a little injury, and he kind of came back, I think, quick. But uh, that just would be what I would tell him, get himself ready, you know, healthy and as, as best he can, up to 90%. Yeah, I, 
I guess the question I've kind of been dying to ask you, who was the toughest receiver you ever <laughs> had to cover? Uh, that would be uh, Andre Reed. Andre Reed was a very good player, very hard to cover. He wasn't like super fast, but he was a he was one of the big receivers. A little bit bigger, pretty good guy on the inside. He wasn't a guy you were gonna draw the ball or lose when you hit him. So I think he was kind of that guy that became that little slot kind of receiver. He did play outside also. He had enough speed, but he was the toughest guy that I had to cover. A lot of times we what we went to was since I guess I was their best corner, they were putting me on the best man. But this time they had me, they said, you take James Lofton and we're going to double. <laughs> it's not we're going to double. I, I said, that's for me. That's a better deal for me. I like that deal. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I never Lofton forget. Was we, played, awesome. you know, we, played, we played Buffalo and it used to be in that fast, that, that run, you know, that kind of gun offense. It was fast. And boy, he was lined up. Hey, he man, ran yeah. around on one side. He ran around on one side, and he <laughs> ran over the other side. Looking back, he turned around. He said, oh, no, it's not going to be one of these days. I said, yeah, James, they got me on you today. This is it. So we <laughs> fought for the whole – we fought that whole day. But, um, yeah, I would say Andre Reed was the toughest guy I played against. Yeah, that K-Gun was a top, tough, tough offense. Uh, very strong. Ooh, yeah. So you you had mentioned that you were a scout with the Cowboys. Uh, is, is there anybody we would we might know that that you had scouted? Um, I scouted. Uh, well, yeah, you would know him. I got to go back because this is a little while back. I, uh, Demarcus Ware. Oh, geez, yes, he was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was stud. Drafted. And uh, we we ended up drafting Marcus uh, from LSU, the, the nose guard. Uh, I can't think of his name. Played Marcus. What his name is? Marcus. He's on uh, Marcus sports. Spears. Marcus Spears. Spears. I said, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got because we had two number ones. We had a first. We had like a second or something, a third and a tenth. And uh, they were kind of fighting over what they were going to use it on because I wanted Roddy White because I said I mm -hmm. I scouted Roddy White. I said, man, I love this guy. He's going to be to me a pro bowler. And I mean, he was playing at UAB. But when I saw him against the competition, I said, man, this guy's really good. Uh oh. This guy's really good. So uh just just to name a few, that was a couple of guys that I scouted uh coming out. Uh Rowdy White uh did get the guy uh oh I can't think of his name. It was a cornerback that I really like. Probably remember it a little bit, but there was a couple of guys that I scouted that were really good players. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Maurice Hurst, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you coming on. <laughs> I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed it. Anytime. Let me know if you need it again. Awesome. I want to remind everybody, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button, whatever you're listening on. We'll see you all next time. Have a great night.